All rise for your full of eight. The International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia is now in session. L'audience tribunal penal international pour l'ex Yugoslavie est ouverte. Please be seated. Case number IT 941T, the prosecutor versus Dusko Tadic. May I have appearances for counsel, please? Your Honor, please, my name is Neiman, and I appear with my colleagues, Ms. Hollis, uh, Mr. Uh, Teager, and Mr. Keegan, and uh, Ms. Sullivan, assisting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neiman. May I have appearances for the defense, please? Yes, Your Honor. My name is Milan Vuin. And uh, with me is today Mr. Nikola Kostic and Jelena Lopicic. Very good. Mr. Vuyang, you have been previously counsel of record for the accused. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And uh, Mr. Kostic has recently uh, uh, joined that team, having been appointed uh, by the registrar upon the entry of an order granting the accused uh, request uh, that uh, Mr. Vladimirov withdraw. Yes, Your Honor. I also was uh, at one time prior uh, uh, and of officially uh, a, an attorney of record, and I have just returned. Very good. Well, you're, you're here once before then. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you're now you're back. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Uh, Loba? Yes. I'm assistant of Mr. Vuin and Mr. Kostic in this case now. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. I would like to uh, this morning uh, read uh, the remarks that we have prepared. Um, in order to prepare the opinion and judgment, which is being handed down in this case today, the trial chamber has had to consider a great quantity of testimonial and written evidence. The trial itself lasted for more than six months, and the transcript runs to more than 7,000 pages. There were more than 400 exhibits to consider, along with the testimony of some 120 witnesses. In addition, being the first such judgment to be issued by this international tribunal, and the first by such a tribunal in relation to serious violations of international humanitarian law, for more than 50 years, the trial chamber has had to explore the relevant factual and legal issues in considerable detail. The written opinion and judgment is a sizable document, with the opinion and judgment itself amounting to more than 300 pages, together with one separate and dissenting opinion and a further 30 pages or so of annexes. For this reason, we have decided not to read the opinion and judgment in full, but to do more than describe its main points, ending with a reading of the judgment itself. The opinion and judgment is divided into eight sections. First is a procedural section setting out the legal steps taken to indict and arrest the accused Dusko Tadic and the procedures both before and during trial that have led to today's judgment. It is followed by a section describing the historical background to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, both in general and in the area of Obstina Priador, where the alleged offenses are said to have taken place. This section sets the scene for the review of the factual evidence and of the accused alibi, which follows. 
Various evidentiary issues that arose during the trial are dealt with in the next portion of the opinion and judgment, and the following section on the applicable law reviews in detail the law to be applied in this case under the statute of the International Tribunal, namely Articles 2, 3, 5, and 7, and under customary international law. This in turn leads to the section on legal findings where the law is applied to the factual findings and conclusions of innocence or guilt are reached. Finally, there is the judgment itself in which the counts charged against the accused are dealt with in turn and a verdict pronounced on each one. I will reiterate what I stated at the opening of this trial exactly one year ago today. This is a trial of an individual accused who entered a plea of not guilty. Although this is the first trial conducted by the International Tribunal and thus has some historic dimension, the goal of the trial chamber was always first and foremost to provide the accused with the fair trial to which he is entitled. This we believe has been done. Now a further word or two about each of the eight sections of this opinion and judgment. Section one is the introduction. As most people will be aware, the accused was the first person to be surrendered to the International Tribunal, being transferred from Germany in April 1995, where he was in custody. This procedural section of the opinion and judgment summarizes the charges of the indictment, which include persecution, inhumane, inhuman treatment, cruel treatment, rape, willful killing, murder, torture, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body and health and inhumane acts, all alleged to have been committed in the Ormoska, Karaturm, and Ternopole camps and at other locations in Obstina Priador in the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It also sets out in some detail the many and varied interlocutory motions that have been filed on both sides and how they were dealt with. Both parties experienced difficulty in obtaining access to the area where the events are said to have occurred and to witnesses who still li live in the region. The trial chamber has been particularly concerned that the defense should have adequate time to prepare its case and acceded to a number of requests for extension of time on this basis. Some witnesses were willing to testify only if their identity was pr protected. Some were given safe conduct, that is protection against indictment by the prosecution while in The Hague to give evidence and a number of defense witnesses unwilling to come to The Hague were permitted to give their testimony via video conferencing link. All of these aspects are covered in the first procedural section of the opinion and judgment. Section two, background and preliminary findings, looks at the context of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia both in general terms and in Obstina Priador. It examines the historical and geographical background leading to the disintegration of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and its impact on Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular. It then examines the historical development of the concept of a greater Serbia and how this idea took root and flourished in the period following the death of Marshal Tito and the collapse of communism in the country. The events that led to the establishment of the Serb autonomous regions are reviewed, as is the formation of crisis staffs in those regions which effectively took over control of the area. The role of the Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, is then looked at in some detail. How its role changed from the disintegration of, during the inter disintegration of Yugoslavia 
and its transformation from a truly national army that reflected the multicultural aspects of federal Yugoslavia into one whose main aim was to protect the Serb people, both within Serbia itself and elsewhere. The background to the division of the JNA into the VJ and the VRS, the latter being the army of Republika Srpska, is looked at in detail, having as it does considerable importance to the applicability of Article 2 of the statute to this case and is the subject of a separate and dissenting opinion. Finally, the opinion and judgment examines the military action taken in the early 1900s following the announcement of independence by both Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. This leads into the discussion and review of events in Obstina Priador itself which must be under understood since they provide the context in which the charges contained in the indictment occurred. The opinion and judgment discusses the state of affairs in Obstina Priador in the years before the Serb takeover in April 1992, the events leading up to that takeover, and the events that followed it, including the armed attack on the town of Kozarats and surrounding villages, and the expulsion of their predominantly Muslim population, with men being sent to some camps and women and children to others. Then follows a description of, these, of those camps, the brutal treatment and the horrific conditions which the prisoners experienced, recounting how many of the men were killed and women prisoners raped. This section of the opinion and judgment ends with a description of the accused himself, his family background in Kozarats, his activities as a karate instructor and cafe proprietor in Kozarats before the conflict, his appointment as president of the local board of the Serb Democratic Party, also his activities after the attack on Kozarats, first as a reserve traffic policeman and later as secretary of the local commune of Kozarets. In section three, factual findings, the trial chamber then considered the factual evidence before it relating to each count of the indictment. The accused is now charged with offenses in 31 counts, each of which is alleged to constitute both a violation of the laws or customs of war and a crime against humanity, and additionally, in the case of 11 counts, a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Two counts are charged alternatively. The indictment is divided into paragraphs relating to individual incidents. The first three paragraphs are of an introductory nature and paragraph four relates to the charge of persecution. Paragraph five was not proceeded with for reasons which are stated in the opinion and judgment. Paragraphs six to 10 relate to incidents at the Ormoska camp. Paragraph 11 to one at Kozarats and paragraph 12 to incidents at the nearby villages of Yaskishi and Sipsi. Due to the cumulative nature of the charge of persecution in paragraph four, the trial chamber reserved its review of it to the end of this section, dealing first with the incidents alleged to have occurred at Armaska in roughly chronological order rather than in the order set out in the indictment then with the charges relating to the incidents alleged to have occurred during the takeover of Kozarats, and then with the incidents, incidents alleged to have taken place at Yaskishi and Sifsi. In respect of each paragraph, the opinion and judgment first reviews the evidence as to the events alleged 
then the evidence as to the role of the accused, followed by the case for the defense. It concludes with findings of fact for each count comprised within the paragraph. In section four, the accused defense of alibi, the trial chamber considers the accused defense, which consisted in essence of a denial of all the allegations against him, supported by an alibi which relies both upon his own testimony given under solemn declaration at trial and that of a number of witnesses and also upon some documentary evidence. Section five, evidentiary matters, is devoted to a discussion of eight distinct matters relating in one way or another to the evidence in this case, its reception and the weight to be given to it. Then follows section six, applicable law which discusses the law relating to the offenses charged. This necessarily includes a lengthy and detailed consideration of the relevant articles of the statute of the International Tribunal and of those aspects of international humanitarian law which they invoke. In section seven, legal findings, the law described earlier is then applied count by count to the facts as already found. Finally, in section eight, the judgment, the trial chamber states its findings, guilty or not guilty, in respect of each count. I will read that section aloud, but before doing so, should say that immediately following it in the opinion and judgment, there appears my own separate and dissenting opinion regarding the applicability of Article II of the statute. That in turn is followed by certain annexes consisting of the indictment, a map, and a number of photographs. I read now section eight being the judgment of the trial chamber. Mr. Tadich. Will you please stand? For the foregoing reasons, having considered all of the evidence and the arguments, the trial chamber finds as follows. One, by a majority, Judge McDonald dissenting, decides that the charges brought under Article II of the Statute of the International Tribunal were, in the present case, inapplicable at the time in Obstina Priador because it has not been proved that the victims were protected persons, which is an element of those offenses charge, charged, and therefore finds the accused Dusko Tadic, not guilty on counts five, eight, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, and the alternative charge under count 27 counts 29 and 32. Two, unanimously finds on the remaining charges as follows. Count one, guilty. Count six, not guilty. Count seven, not guilty. Count 10, guilty. Count 11, guilty, count 13, guilty, count 14, guilty, count 16, guilty, count 17, guilty, count 19, 
not guilty. Count 20, not guilty. Count 22, guilty. Count 23, guilty. Count 25, not guilty. Count 26, and the alternative charge under count 28, not guilty. Count 30, not guilty. Count 31, not guilty. Count 33, guilty in respect of Beto Balic, Sefik Balic, Ismet Yaskic, and Salko Yaskic. Not guilty as to Elias Elkosovich, Nias Elkosovich, Meho Kenyar, and Adam Jakopovich. Count 34, guilty in respect of Beto Balic, Sefik Balic, Ismet Yaskic, and Salko Yaskic. Not guilty as to Elias Elkosovich, Nias Elkosovich, Meho Kenyar, and Adam Yakupovich. Mr. Tadic, having been found guilty by the trial chamber, of 11 counts of the counts uh, 11 of the counts on which you are charged you will remain in custody at the United Nations detention center pending the completion of the sentencing proceedings and of any appeal that may be lodged you may be seated The trial chamber has scheduled a sentencing for July 1st at 10 a.m. If either party wishes to provide written submissions, they are to be fi filed by Monday, June 9th. If either party wishes to offer any oral testimony uh, prior to sentencing, you should advise the trial chamber in your written submissions. And we would then hear that uh, those statements uh, on either June 17th, 18th, 19th, or 20th. We need to know, of course, uh, what your plans are in terms of uh, offering any, any statements and how long you will need for that purpose. Uh, but we will set aside uh, those four days if needed, however you need to advise uh, the trial chamber. Sentencing then is set for July 1st at 10 a.m. Are there any other matters that should be brought to the attention of the trial chamber at this time? Mr. Neiman. No, Your Honor. Mr. Booying. No, Your Honor. Trial chamber then will adjourn. All rise for your full of eight.